Now that we've reviewed the pathophysiology of the platelet plug formation through adhesion, activation, and aggregation, let us transition into the medications that could be utilized as antiplatelet medications. These would be drugs that block the platelet plug formation. All of the drugs that we're going to cover in this next section are all blocking platelet activity. Here is a list of all of the antiplatelet medications available. As we go through these medications, you'll notice that I am just touching on these medications. The specifics of dosing and pharmacology will be covered in more detail during other parts of cardiology as we talk about the therapeutics where these drugs are used. So Dr. Bakta will pick up on the pharmacology of these drugs and the dosing of these drugs in the therapeutic sections. So we have two main classes of drugs if we think about how these actually work. The majority of antiplatelet medications block activation, and then we have one newer class of anti-aggregates in the GP2B3A re receptor antagonist class. So where do these work within the platelet plug? We have our COX-1 inhibitor, our antithromboxane drug, specifically aspirin, will block thromboxane A2, thereby reducing the activation of neighboring platelets. We have ADP receptor antagonists. These are blocking the ADP receptors, which are denoted here as P2Y1, P2Y12 receptors. That is blocking the activation of that neighboring platelet. We also have anti-aggregate drugs, which are GP2B3A receptor antagonists. Those are antagonizing those receptors that blocks the ability of those receptors to aggregate together, blocking the platelet plug formation. The most commonly prescribed and utilized antiplatelet therapy within the world is our aspirin therapy. It is abbreviated here, so make sure that you're familiar with what ASA stands for. It is important to understand that the mechanism of action that we deal with here is our antiplatelet dosing. So this is a low dose aspirin. It is irreversible at the COX-1 selective for the dosing that we're talking about. Uh, although I don't assess on your dosing, it's important to know that when we're using it as an antiplatelet, it is pretty selective for COX-1 since that's all we're trying to do is block thromboxane A2. So it is irreversible, meaning that it is not reversible on that receptor, COX-1 inhibitor. The remaining section of this slide is important for you to be able to counsel patients on so you don't chew or crush the enteric coated tablets. That makes sense. And you should take it with a full glass of water to avoid that GI distress. That also makes sense. And if a patient is having a cardiac event and they want to take their aspirin in order to protect themselves, they must chew that tablet because the most common prescribed or utilized form is enteric coated. That is a delayed release. It does not release until your small intestine, in which case we want it to work immediately in this patient population and they must chew it. As I mentioned before, the dosing of aspirin that we're talking about is selective for COX-1. If we think about the arachidonic acid pathway, we have a few ways that we could break down arachidonic acid. We can go through the cyclooxygenase pathway or we can go through the lipoxygenase pathway. Uh, COX enzymes can be broken down into COX-1 on the right here or COX-2 on the left. And you should be familiar with this graphical image. It is pretty common to discuss this when talking about NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as well as aspirin and other drugs that work within this area, including monoleucast, which is blocking our leukotrienes. So aspirin does have specific precautions surrounding age and pregnancy. It should not be used for children under the age of 16 years due to the risk of Rye syndrome. We also want to avoid it in pregnancy and breastfeeding. There are some interesting ADRs associated with aspirin. Uh, you may recall that if we're blocking the cyclooxygenase pathway, that arachidonic acid could shift to the leukotriene production, so the, through the lipooxygenase pathway, we get a byproduct of increased leukotrienes. If someone has severe asthma, 
this may not be the right therapy for them as it can induce bronchospasms. Not normally uh, too big of a concern in your average population. In our elderly population that continue to take this, uh, they have chronic use, they're at higher doses. This can lead to tinnitus or tinnitus, which is that ringing in the ears. And then in rare instances, you may see a true allergy, whether it be through a rash or urticaria. Uh, the patient is intolerant to the aspirin and they could go through desensitization or just pick a different class. There are three in the thionopyridine class of ADP receptor antagonists. These, were, these have been around for a while. And then most recently we have the newest released agent, which is kind of a subfamily of the ADP receptor antagonists, and that is Ticagrelor, branded as Berlinta. And as you can see, they have similar yet different chemical structures. As we get down to Berlinta, it is very different than the predecessors as we see above. It is important that you understand which drugs fall into which class within this packet. So you should be familiar with both brand and generic names as we go through and you see brand names, become familiar with both in preparation for NAPLEX. The first three that were approved in the market are Ticlopidine, which is Ticlid, Clopidogrel, branded as Plavix, and Prosegrel branded as effiant. These are all irreversible. They bind at the P2Y12 receptor, thereby blocking activation. All that I ask that you recall in this packet for these drugs is the black box warning. So with ticlopidine, it is important that you understand the blood dyscrasias that are associated with the use of this drug. It can cause neutropenia, agranulocytosis, TTP, and the like in which case you should be monitoring your patients every two weeks with the CBC to watch their blood products. Clopidogrel has a black box warning for C CYP2, C19 poor metabolizers. As you recall, these are all prodrugs. Our ticlopidine, clopidogrel, and prosegrel are all prodrugs, so they need to be activated. If a patient is a CYP2, C19 poor metabolizer, or they're taking drugs that competitively inhibit this metabolism, then you can end up with decreased potency of your clopidogrel, uh, lower than what you would expect it to, do, to have so that it's not working as effectively. And then prosegrel can be contraindicated in patients in the elderly population, so greater than or equal to 75 years of age. If we have a low weight patient, so someone less than 60 kilos, we may consider a lower dose. And then if they have a history of CVA, that is a history of a previous stroke, ischemic stroke, we would contraindicate Prosegrel. It is only used in the heart, as you recall from P1. And if they have active pathological bleeding, we, that totally makes sense. And thrombocytopenia, if they have a low platelet count, we probably should not be using antiplatelets. In the Ticagrelor class, this is, this is kind of a newer drug. It is branded as Berlinta, so be familiar with the brand names as well. This is a reversible P2Y12 receptor antagonist, thereby blocking activation. But different from the previous three that I mentioned already, Ticagrelor is an active drug, so it does not require metabolism to become active. It does, however, have a black box warning. For that concomitant aspirin use, what we saw was when we maintain aspirin at doses above 100 milligrams, it actually decreased the efficacy of Ticagrelor. So this is an important note to recall, is that aspirin actually decreases the effectiveness of Ticagrelor at higher dosing. So all of your maintenance dosing for aspirin, which would be given alongside your Ticagrelor, should be at least, or should be no higher than 100 milligrams a day. Here is a list of our GP2B3A receptor antagonists. If you recall, these are blocking aggregation of the platelets. We have three in class. We have abciximab, Riopro, eptifibotide, Integralin, and tyropaban, Agrisat. These are all IV formulations, and Dr. Bakta will go into great detail in when and how these are used in the therapeutics 
we have two drugs that are being presented here as PDE inhibitors. However, it's important to note that one of them could be used in combination with aspirin or antithromboxane medication in order to prevent antiplatelet activity or to promote antiplatelet activity. We have dipyridomol, which has monotherapy branded as persantine, and we have dipyridomol extended release combined with a small dose of aspirin to form Agronox. This is a capsule that uh, we'll learn about in stroke prevention. And then we have Solostazole, which is pletal, and Dr. Bakta again will go into the details of when and how to use these drugs in the therapeutics. So let's go through a review of this process one more time. We have at the top here an injured vessel wall that is exposing collagen and we get two receptors that are readily available on the resting platelet. So we have GP1A receptors which will bind directly to collagen and we have GP1B receptors which will bind to von Willebrand factor then to collagen. In either of these processes we call that adhesion. Once we have adhesion we activate that platelet that platelet then goes through a conformational change as it's activating. That will release or degranulate its vesicles. Those vesicles contain ADP and thromboxane A2, as well as other substances which we've learned along the way. That conformational change will also express GP2B3A receptors on that platelet, which are the most abundant receptors on the platelet, but are only available in an active platelet. As we release that ADP and thromboxane A2, those substances circulate through the blood and come into contact with a resting platelet nearby. This platelet then can be bound and go through activation here where we get a conformational change expressing further GP2B3A receptors as well as degranulation of the vesicles in this platelet which can go and activate neighboring platelets nearby as well. That is activation. That is quickly followed by aggregation. Aggregation is bringing these platelets together through the binding of GP2B3A receptors to fibrinogen, then to neighboring GP2B3A receptors on an re active platelet nearby that will aggregate these platelets together we can also aggregate platelets using von Willebrand factor in this step. So where do the drugs fall into this picture? We see aspirin, which is our antithromboxane drug that is COX-1 selective. It is irreversible at COX-1. That is blocking the release of thromboxane A2, which is, as we know, an activator of neighboring platelets. We also talked about ticlopidine Clopidogrel, Prosegrel, and our newest drug, Ticagrelor. We have uh, these drugs are ADP receptor antagonists. These are either irreversible or reversible, depending on the drug, and they bind to the P2Y12 receptor, which is commonly referred to as our ADP receptor on our active platelet. And then finally, well, not finally. We also have our dipyridomol and solostazole. These drugs are blocking in the blocking the PDE. So we have phosphodiesterase inhibitors. That PDE is utilized in the activation of CAMP into ADP. So if we block it, then we don't have ADP. Thereby, we don't have further activation of these platelets. And then finally, we have three drugs in class as our GP2B3A receptor antagonists, that is abcixumab, abtifibotide, and tyrofaban that all block aggregation.